worship together this morning.
Sing with me, I count. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now. And in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify.
over us, your protection. Lord, you're so good to each one of us, Father. We just praise you. You are a good God, worthy of all praise and thanksgiving. And everyone said, church, before you see it, just turn around and give somebody a big smile and welcome to church this morning. Amen. try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, that's great. 
We're going to, we had passed out to you little uh, wafers and little juice in that one little container. I forgot to do it myself this morning, but you know what? There's two layers to the lid. I'll just remind us right now. You better be careful, otherwise you'll have a little problem on your hands. So, the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. I want you to remember that night was Passover. What was Passover all about? It was a reminder to the nation of Israel how they were instituted as a congregation, as a people in covenant with God. And on that night, the death angel passed over the nation of Israel, but judgment fell on the firstborn in the land of Egypt. And it was out of that experience that Pharaoh said, you can now go. And the nation left the land of bondage. Isn't that a beautiful story? And really, it's a shadow. I'm going to talk about that this morning. It's a type of a greater experience. When Jesus came, he now becomes that Passover lamb. Jesus is the one who actually sets us free from a greater captivity to captivity to sin. And it's not just for a Jewish group of people, but as we're going to hear this morning, it's for everybody. You know, what, what Jesus did was break, break down a middle wall of partition between the people of God, the Jews, and Gentiles who are not the people of God and has now invited us all into one family and that we come into covenant with him this morning. And so every time we do this, we're remembering what Jesus Christ did on our behalf, this great act of redemption. If I could say it this way, the greatest act of redemption in the Old Testament was the Passover. And the greatest act of all time of redemption, and then what the Passover was pointing to, was the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're reminding ourselves of this amazing sacrifice on our behalf. And every time we eat this bread and we drink this blood, we are actually coming in communion with our Lord and our Savior. And listen to me right now. Every benefit from this great salvation, which I believe includes things like healing, flows into our lives. And if we, you know, make our hearts right with God and we have no outstanding obstructions in our relationship with God, you say, how do I get rid of those things? Confessing our sins and making things right with our brothers and sisters. Then we're in complete freedom to participate in communion. For I received from the Lord, Paul says, what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, Father, as we receive now of this emblem, I pray that all of the benefits of your amazing sacrifice be ours this day, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat this bread together. says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, Father, we thank you for this cup, which represents the shedding of your blood, which speaks of even beyond that to the resurrection and ultimately to your coming again. And I pray today as we hear of these beautiful themes that the end result in our hearts will be inexpressible joy. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's drink this cup together. Can you hang on to these little cups and when you leave the building today, can you just... Dispose of them on the way out. There'll be uh, dispensaries there for you. That's great. Thank you.
Well, hey there, everyone. My name's Brady. Welcome to Living Stones Church. Whether you are here with us in person or tuning in to our live stream, we want to connect with you. We invite you to fill out our Connect card to let us know how you are doing. Send us your prayer requests, changes to your contact information. Let us know if you are new or if you'd like more information about Living Stones Church. Connect cards can be picked up at the church office or guest reception and dropped off at the office or in the slot at the information center. You can also fill them out online at livingstones.com. .ab.ca/connect and if you are here in person and would like to give you can do so at the church office right after the service if you're joining us online and would like to give simply click on the give button on our website this fall, we are thrilled to be welcoming back more and more of our church family. We've always been so blessed with exceptionally high numbers of volunteers, but a lot has changed during the pandemic. As more of you are joining with us to gather in person, our need for help is also increasing. So check out the Super 7 Places to Serve and let us know if there's an area you can help. For more info on these and other areas, call the church office or go to our website. Save the date for three nights of prayer and fasting from October 19th to the 21st. Join us in the sanctuary from 7 to 8.30 p.m. as we pray together for our individual needs, our church, our community, and our nation. If you're unable to join us in person, you can join our live stream all three nights on Facebook, YouTube, or on our website. You are invited to join our middle and high school youth for their Truth Wars game show on October 28th at 7 p.m. Contestants will engage in a battle of the mind and test their biblical knowledge. Join us in person or on live stream to cheer our contestants on and have the chance to win some epic prizes, hundreds of questions, 12 contestants, and five nights. Check out our website for upcoming Truth Wars game nights. And hey, thanks again for hanging out with us this weekend. If you have questions about anything you've heard today, or if you just want to find out more about the church, stop by the guest reception kiosk, the church office, or visit us online. We wish all of you a happy Thanksgiving long weekend. All right, so middle school students, you can slip out right now and head to your class. Appreciate that. Also, I'm going to have the rest of us just stand where going to go to the Lord in prayer. And just point out to you, you know, maybe you're saying, oh, there's a lot of people here this morning. That's great. I'm happy. I, I think we can, you know, we're going to find a way to get everybody back to church. So if you're a little nervous about how many people are here this morning, come tonight, next week. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> come to the evening service is what I meant to say. Because I've noticed there's a lot of room there. You can just, you can have like 20 rows ahead of you and there's nobody there. So you've got a lot of space for you to still come back to church. So... Uh, yeah, we're going to have overflow space available. We have that as well. There's a lot of strategies so that there's always a way to get you here. How, how about that? I'll never... Yeah, that's good. We'll find a way. Yeah. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. How many are excited? It's Thanksgiving weekend. Isn't that a great weekend? Isn't that awesome? Amen. And you know, we have so much to be thankful for. I've, I... I, I actually wrote a letter to our premier just to thank him for living in an amazing province and just the way they're showing leadership and allowing the people to have a bit of freedom and give, making us responsible for uh, following protocol and stuff like that. And rather than the government taking away our freedom and they're making all the calls, uh, I'm so thankful for the leadership that they've shown in doing this. And so I thought I would, you know, how many know when you're a leader, you usually get all the complaints, but it's very, very rare when people say to you, wow, you might be doing a good job. So I, I decided to write him a letter and thank him. How's that? Amen. So, yeah, it's good. So let's pray. Father, we are so blessed as your people, and we, we sense that, Lord, and we want to express our gratitude, our thanksgiving this morning. And Lord, as I, I share on this amazing topic of joy, Lord, I just pray that we will live in your joy. We will have what Peter describes, that inexpressible joy, that, that inexplicable joy, that wonderful sense that you are with us and empowering our lives and regardless of the crisis or the difficulty or the challenge that lie before us, Lord, that you're giving us the strength that we need to face the hour in which we're living, not with despair, not with frustration, not with hopelessness, but Lord, with inexpressible joy. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated. You know, how many know that joy 
as I've been chatting about, seems to be in short supply these days. How many know that's true? It just seems like problems, challenges, difficulties. You know, I thought about this, you know, and I was praying for 2020. I said, Lord, this is going to be the year of vision. Little did I know, God says, yeah, it will be a year of vision called X-ray vision. <laughs> How many have noticed, instead of looking out, we've all known, all of a sudden realized we're looking inward and we're saying, wow, there's stuff here that shouldn't be here. How many kind of noticed that? But I want to just encourage us this morning, you know, I think there are a lot of joy robbers, things that come into our life that are designed to steal our joy. And you say, why is joy such an important commodity? Because the scriptures teach us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so when we don't have joy, we just seem to be weak, and we just seem to be faltering, and we seem to be struggling. So when we don't have joy, we tend to succumb to things like fear and doubt and unbelief, so what do we mean by joy? Isn't that a great question? Because I think it's kind of a misunderstood idea. And, you know, is it only an emotion? Or is joy something more profound and gives us sustaining grace in times of difficulty? August, Augustine of Hippo was born in 354 in North Africa, which at that time was part of the Roman Empire. And John Piper relates in his book, The Legacy of Sovereign Joy, at first Augustine resisted the triumph of grace as an enemy. But then in a garden in Milan, Italy, when he was 31, the power of grace through the truth of God's word broke actually into his life. 15 years of bondage to sexual lust and living with a concubine. And as he says, his resistance was finally overcome by sovereign joy. The beautiful name he, that's Augustine, gave to God's grace. Isn't that a beautiful thing? I love that. And you know, in his book's confession, I, I've, I've read parts of it. Confessions is his autobiography, and if you've ever read it, I haven't finished the book, but I've read good chunks of it, and it's actually a prayer. And there's different people that do translation. And then this particular translation, which is really a testimonial prayer, this is what Augustine writes. How sweet all at once it was for me to be rid of those fruitless joys which I had once feared to lose. I, I love that expression, fruitless joys. You drove them from me, you who are the true, the sovereign joy. You drove them from me and took their place, you who are sweeter than all pleasure. O Lord, my God, my light, my wealth, and my salvation. I love that. For Augustine, the joy of knowing the grace of God that transformed even his deepest desires for what was less than the best, namely knowing God and God's wonderful, life-changing grace. Isn't that beautiful? Do you know what happens when God really fills our heart? He eradicates a lot of things that we've been pursuing to fill the emptiness in our soul. Isn't that amazing? And I believe that the joy of knowing God and experiencing his grace is so sweet. I agree with Augustine. It's so amazing. And I believe that's what joy is all about. And here we are celebrating Thanksgiving. We're reminded that this is a moment to be grateful for all that we have been given. You know, we've been given an amazing country to live in. We've been given an amazing province to live in. We've been given an amazing community to live in. Boy, when I take a look at how bad COVID is around the world and how, you know, unaffected in some ways, I know we're affected in Red Bird, not to the degree that so many other parts of the world are. Man, I just feel inexpressible gratitude and thanksgiving to God for that. The fact that we could meet together like this. Many parts, even of our own country, can't gather like this right now. You know, this is so powerful. It's an, and, and then I, when we think of, you know, our family and we think of the things that make life worthwhile, but as wonderful as celebrating and being grateful for all the blessings in our lives, there's one element, regardless of how challenging life becomes, that's an even greater cause for us to be filled with thanksgiving and to be filled with joy, and that's knowing God, and that's knowing him in a personal way. It's an amazing joy that Augustine talks about. So what is it? You know, Noah defines joy as a very glad feeling, happiness, great pleasure, delight, the cause of joy or happiness, the expressions of this feeling, not different terms. And then I, I wanted to get theological, so I looked it up. You know, Lexing, Lexum Theological Workbook says, joy is that sense or state of gladness uh, 
or elation that people experience through their relationship with God and through good things in their lives. And so in other words, they are saying, it's because of God that's, that's happening. As a matter of fact, I would say, as James does, I would concur and, and emphasize that every good and perfect gift comes from God. Isn't that true? And so every good thing that you have in your life, you just need to be saying, thank you, Lord, for your good things. James May tells us, and we're going to look at Psalm 98 today, and he, he says about Psalm 98, uh, this is actually the text that Isaac Watts uh, used to write the hymn that we sing at Christmas time, and Mark uh, reminded me this morning, it's not just a Christmas song. It really is not. When you l- sing this beautiful hymn, Joy to the World. Actually, Joy to the World was inspired by Psalm 98. The hymn celebrates the birth of Jesus as the coming of the Lord to rule the world with truth and grace. It uses the language and themes of the psalm in order to say that this nativity, this coming of Christ, this event is of the kind and significance proclaimed in the psalm. Because I think it's more than just the nativities we're going to see this morning. As a matter of fact, the psalm announces the coming of the Savior King, uh, uh, God as King of the world. So while the nativity is the beginning of a redemptive work that brings such joy into our world, there are many results of God's grace that brings joy to us. And one such aspect is the hope and joy we gain by realizing that not only is God in control, I think, you know, a number of weeks ago I was preaching in Proverbs, I tried to show you that no matter who the leader or God is still ultimately in control, but that he himself will finally come to rule and reign and destroy all sin on this planet. And won't that be a glorious day? We're going to look at that this morning. So I want to take a look at Psalm 98. I think there's three stanzas or three movements to the song. And we're going to look at, first of all, it's a call to praise the Lord for past victories. Here the call is specifically to Israel, the people of God, as a witness to all the nations. We must keep in mind that as believers in Christ, we are the new Israel. Isn't that interesting? And Paul says that in the book of Galatians. We're now included into this amazing relationship with God on a covenantal basis. As the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Romans, we have been grafted into the family tree. How many think that's nice? Isn't that great? We're grafted in. We're part of God's family tree. Your name is hanging in God's family tree. Doesn't that bless you? It blesses me, you know. What did Jesus, when Jesus died and rose again, he actually created a single grouping of people that contains both Jew and Gentile into one body called the church. And this is what he said. And I, I love this verse. It summarizes it, but the whole chapter talks about it. This mystery that is through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. You know what he's saying there? That everything that God promised to Israel, now we have joined in and are part of that promise. You and I are, uh, we can say that our father is Abraham. And it's not because of a racial thing. It's not because of, you know, national descent in that way. We are, we are children of Abraham because we're children of faith. And Abraham was a man of faith. And that's the true aspect of what it means to be a child of God. We're entering in through that same door that Abraham came through. Here in Psalm 98, we see this call to praise. Let's take a look at it. Verse 1, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel, and all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So, Here the psalmist is causing God's people to do what? To praise him. Why? Because he is a redeemer. He has set them free from slavery. Beautiful. And, you know, as I said earlier in communion, the great redemptive act in the Old Testament was the Exodus. Beautiful story. Brought the Israelites out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt, allowed them into a a covenant relationship. God led them into the wilderness that they could worship him, and they met with him on Mount Sinai, and God established a covenant with them there. Isn't that true? 
All true. And then he brought him into the promised land. And let me say something to all of us. That's all beautiful foreshadowing and a picture of what God was ultimately going to do with all of the people on the planet, that he was going to bring us all into a covenant with him, that we were all going to enter into this powerful relationship so that you and I could ultimately experience the amazing promises of God. And they're fulfilled as you, you read through all the way to the book of Revelation. Now, notice the expression, they were to sing a new song. You know, what does that really mean? You know, I, you know, I used to read that when I was a brand new Christian. I was just thinking, oh, that's great. Somebody's going to get a new song. You know, we're going to, you know, I've heard all kinds of interesting interpretations and understandings of this word, a new song. It's like, you know, okay, God's giving me new ways of expressing praise to him. But I think it has a far more significant theological meaning. And I want to just quote Dr. Longman, and he says this regarding the context or meaning of the term. He says, New song occurs elsewhere in the Psalms, uh, Psalm 33, 40, 96, 144, and 149, verse 1, as well as in Isaiah 42, 10, in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 9, and 14, 3, you see the expression, a new song, and it's all in a context, and it's in a context connected to warfare. Isn't that interesting? Hmm, a new song connected to warfare. What's it all about? He goes on, a new song is a hymn of victory sung after God has made all things new by his defeat of the forces of evil. So it's a new song of celebration over the enemy's defeat. Oh, what's going to happen? It says God's right hand and his holy arm typically denoting his power in battle. So the salvation that the psalmist is celebrating is a military one. Now, a new song, as I've already said, comes because of God's great power and his love for us. There's a new song as an expression of celebration after a great victory. Now, I want to bring you back to a moment in Israel's history. Okay, the great moment. What happens? They've come out of the land of Egypt, and all of a sudden, they're camped at the Red Sea. Remember that? Oh, boy, it didn't look good for them there. God brought them there. How many have ever been camped by the Red Sea? I'm not talking about literally. I'm talking about you've been a place in your life where you felt God directed you, and all of a sudden, there was no way out. And you just felt like, you know, you're in trouble right now because the enemy looks like he's going to overpower and defeat you. You ever been to that place where you felt almost defeated by the enemy? You ever felt that way? But what happened was God parted the Red Sea, and the Israels crossed on dry ground. How many know that was a miracle? How many know that was a miracle? Isn't that amazing? So God opened the Red Sea, which was a miraculous power by his mighty right arm, and the Egyptian army, the most powerful unit in the entire world at that time, went into the Red Sea, and they were drowned. And so what did they do at the next morning when the Israelites are looking at the Red Sea that had come crashing back and floating bodies and all kinds of things are happening? I mean, the Israelites, they didn't fight the battle. Who fought that battle? Who fought that battle? God fought that battle. And then Moses sung a new song. And the new song goes like this in Exodus 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will praise him, my Father's God. I will exalt him. The Lord is is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. Your right hand, your right hand. Remember that? We're just reading this in Psalm 98. Your right hand was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. I love that statement. Hey, I thought he, you know, doesn't it look like, you know, they were opposing Israel? But the reality is whenever you touch God's people, you are opposing Almighty God. And God says here in in Moses' song, you threw down those who opposed you. I wouldn't want to mess with God's kids because you're going to be messing with God. You know who our elder brother is? His name is Jesus. Don't mess with us. 
I'll tell my big brother on you. <laughs> right? You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands have established. The Lord reigns forever and ever. How many get a little sense they were partying at the Red Sea? Do you get a little sense Miriam took the tambourine, the ladies went out and started dancing, they were singing, their shofars were blowing, they were celebrating. How many think they were probably celebrating on the Red Sea as they saw their enemies defeated? And how many here can say that when you were in a great hour of trial and God delivered you from your trial, that after you came out of that trial, you had a new song in your heart. You were dancing, you were praising, you were shouting, you were giving out a cry of victory. As a matter of fact, we're going to read in Psalm 90, it says, shout for joy. It's a military cry. It's an expression of exaltation to Almighty God because you've experienced God's amazing supernatural power. Did you hear that? Supernatural power. Because we are celebrating the marvelous things that he has done for us. Look at verse 2. The Lord has made his salvation known. Sorry, back to verse one. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Derek Kidner says, this salvation victory is wholly supernatural. How many of you know the parting of the Red Sea was wholly supernatural? How many know the resurrection of Jesus Christ was wholly supernatural? How many know that your salvation is wholly supernatural? That is a marvelous thing. He says here, which is more than a superlative. This is not just an expression of speech he's saying. It's a standard term for the miraculous interventions of God, such as those at the Exodus to save his people. Oh, I love this. It's gonna get better. Yeah, we're we're just warming up. You say, how do you know we're warming up? Hey, wait till you hear what's coming down. We're not done yet. We're just warming up. Listen to this. Now, this... Exodus experience is only a shadow. The Exodus experience is only a type of a greater act of redemption. Isn't that beautiful? It's all pointing to what Jesus Christ did on the cross and what he does for us. Do you know it's one thing to be saved from an Egyptian army? It's one thing to be saved from momentary physical danger. But how about to be saved from sin? How about to be saved forever from death? How about to be ever in the presence of Almighty God? How about to be totally transformed? How many here say, it'll be a great day when I get a brand new body Woo! that will never fade away and never deteriorate? How many think that's pretty good? How do you think this one? We're in the presence of God forever and ever with no sin to ever deal with, no sin within, no sin without. Living forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Do we get a sense of how powerful this really is? Let me move on to the second movement of the song of joy. It's a call to praise God as king in the presence. We've looked at that past events of God's saving work on our behalf, but we need to praise God in the now. Each and every day is a day of salvation. I love what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Listen, there's grace for every single day of your and my life. There's a grace for today. And he says, for he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of God's salvation. Now, I know we can look at this and say, well, yes, that's great, Pastor. I I, I did open my heart. I did receive Christ. That was a day of favor. That was a day of salvation. Can I just say to you, not only do we get saved by grace, we can experience his grace every single day. Every day can be in our minds a day of God's salvation, victory, and favor. And so often as Christians, we walk around in defeat. Come on now. Isn't that true? You know, but we should get up in the morning and say, Lord, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is a day of victory. This is a day of favor. I'm looking for you to show up today and do amazing things in this moment, in this day. Notice this call to all of humanity, and it extends to all nations in verse 4. 
Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. How many saints, this is a party atmosphere. Anybody get a sense? This is a call to party. Are we hearing it? You know, a lot of, you know, the people in the world, they live for the weekend, right? Come on now, isn't that true? They're looking for the party. They're, they, you know, they, they drudge through all week long to get through their tasks so they can party on the weekend. Folks, I want to tell you, if you're a child of God, you can party, but not just on the weekend. You and I should have a party every single day. We don't have to get up and wait for the party. The party's already here. Shout to joy to the Lord. Make music to the Lord with harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. We need to live with great anticipation of our King and of his coming. And every time we worship him is actually a rehearsal for the moment in which he will appear. I'm going to quote Derek Kidner. I, I like what he says about this psalm. He says this, so there are two levels to the scene. One God's day of power at his coming. And the other, it's anticipation in every act of worship. The psalms we sing are now a rehearsal and God's presence among his worshiper is a prelude to his appearing to the world. You know what we're doing? We're practicing. You know, we're practicing. Every time we get together and we're singing and worshiping God, you know what we're practicing for? We're practicing for the day he comes. Now, how many think that when Jesus shows up, we're going to have a real hallelujah hoedown? Does anybody get that? Are we going to get excited? I mean, we're going to say, it finally happened. I know sometimes we questioned, sometimes we wondered, sometimes we fretted, sometimes we thought this day would never come. How many have ever had those experiences in life where you wondered if this day would ever come? You know, some young women, they're, you know, they get married and there's a date and it's two years off or a year and a half off or a year, but eventually they keep working and preparing and working and preparing until finally that day comes. Can I make a declaration to you? The day is coming. The day is coming. Jesus is coming again. You know, we lose hope because we don't think about that. But if you and I have that blessed hope within our heart, it does something inside of our soul. The Bible says it purifies our heart. It brings hope in our lives. It brings joy. It gives us strength. We have something to look forward to. When you have nothing to look forward to, you have no hope. And a lot of people today are despairing in this world because they have nothing to look forward to. They have no hope in their hearts because when you don't have God, you don't have hope. But when you have God, you have hope because he's coming again. We have something to look forward to. And I want to show you from the scriptures how this materialized in the past, in the past his historical context. You know, I want you to think back to that day called Palm Sunday. I want you to think back to that prophecy that Zechariah brought to the nation of Israel in chapter 9, verse 9, when he said, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout. How many get a sense? This is almost Psalm 98 being re-echoed here. Daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. But look at verse 10. That's usually where we stop. But look what verse 10 says. And I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken, and he will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So in the mind of the Jewish person, they were thinking, listen, when, when our God comes, when our king comes, when the Messiah, the anointed one comes, he's going to do this. He's going to destroy the oppressors. Rome is going to be defeated. We're going to have peace in the land. We're going to have a righteous rule. They were looking forward to that which you and I are looking forward to. And so when Jesus came riding that donkey, something powerful was happening. They had this understanding in their mind. Is that powerful? I love it. And there, there's a sense, this, the shout in the Hebrew language, it's a cry of victory after military conquest. Now I want you to notice what Matthew tells us as Jesus was riding in in Matthew chapter 21, verse 10, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? That word stirred there in the Greek language is the word we get seismic from. There was a, there was a shift. There was a, a, an excitement that was happening. They, you know, the enthusiasm, the, the sense of, uh, uh, of acceleration was just so powerful. You could feel it. They, they were believing. And, you know, they weren't off to, by too much because they believed God was coming. And listen, I, Jesus was God, and he was coming. He was coming in their midst. Can you imagine having that in your heart and mind and believing that your God is so great? The one who framed and created the entire world could easily displace Romans. 
They had no problem with that. And so they were throwing down those palm branches. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 19, in the same story, he says, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices. Why were they doing that? For all the miracles they had seen. Let's go back to Psalm 91, 98, verse 1. What does it say there? Because of the marvelous things which he had done. How many are getting a sense This is exactly what was going on. Can you imagine this sense of excitement? I mean, the the Pharisees were so wroth by what was going on. They told Jesus to tell these guys to shut up. Jesus says, if I tell them to stop praising, he says, even the rocks will cry out. Remember that? Boy, that was powerful. Okay. Let's move on to the third movement. It's going to get better. (laughs) The song is a call to praise God as judge over all the creation in the future. Now we're coming to the, you know, how many know there's a crescendo to a song? We're coming to the crescendo. We're coming to the conclusion. We see that all of creation is about ready to join in. How many know these great oratories, these great masterpieces, you know, where the the movement starts building up? How many have ever been to a, a great orchestration, and then you have the orchestra going, and then all of a sudden, you sense it. It's building and building and building, and it's coming to this great crescendo. I remember one time, we were in Bible college. I was doing a music class, and we had to go to some concert somewhere, you know, some orchestration, and I don't know what what they were playing. I've never, I I don't, I just am not that familiar with music, but I just remember this one day, as they were building to that crescendo, something inside of me was rising up. You ever feel that your spirit is lifting, and I felt like just about jumping out of my, my seat and just screaming with absolute elation and joy. There was something rising within my spirit. Anybody ever have that experience? You can hardly contain yourself with just over-exuding elation and joy. That's what we're going to get in this song. I love it. It says, let the sea resound in everything in it, the world and all who live in it. What is he saying? Okay, you're the conductor over here. God is the conductor, and he's holding back all of these different instrumentations, but now he's going to let them all go. Do you get a feeling for that? The drums are starting to build and all of the instruments are coming in to play. It says, let everything that has breath. I mean, that's what Psalm 150 says. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. It says, let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. It says, let them sing before the Lord for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. I want you to notice this poetic imagery and what it really means. It's a call for all of creation to enter in and worship God. Death had really, has really affected our created world. Does anybody know that? Every time you see and hear of a hurricane, tornado, earthquake, volcano, you know what that really is? That's the created world groaning under the weight of the sin that broke into this planet. That's not how God initially and originally created this world. That's that's a a deviation from God's ultimate purpose. But God has a way of straightening it out. And take a look at what Romans chapter 8 says. I think Paul is giving us an insight into this. He says, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. What's he saying? He's saying he's waiting until finally, you know, you and I are becoming transformed. He's waiting to see this day when Christ comes back and, you know, the sons of God's, you and I, the children of God are being transformed. And he says this, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. What's he talking about here? He's saying when Adam sinned, when humanity sinned, sin broke into the world and cursed every part of creation. But there's a day coming when ultimately all of humanity is redeemed. Yes, God's going to redeem humanity. Now, some of, there's rebels, I know that. I know that not everyone's going to get to heaven. I get that, but I'm trying to paint a picture here. There's a transformation happening here. Hang on, guys. A transformation happening, right? It says that the creation itself will be liberated from the bondage to decay. What's the bondage to decay? That's talking about death and dying, folks. We're in a bondage to decay. I hate to tell you this, but we're all dying physically at some point. And so is this world, it's, it's winding down and brought into the freedom 
and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of of childbirth right up until the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship. And what's the ultimate expression of our, our redemption? The transformation of our earthly bodies. Yeah, your, your, your soul has been transformed, your spirit has been transformed, but your body needs to be transformed. We're not totally, we're saved, but yet we're going to be saved. Does that make sense? Paul says that. We're saved, but yet we're going to be saved. It's a, you know, I, I, I'm sanctified, but I'm still being sanctified, you know, and eventually I'm going to be glorified. I'm going to have a brand new body. Wow, that's amazing what God's going to do there. And probably then you don't have to watch what you eat. <laughs> Well, because there's going to be a feast, you know. There's a, the marriage supper of the Lamb. I can't think of one wedding without food, right? It's going to happen. There's going to be feasting. Wow, and we're going to have fun. Why are we rejoicing that God is coming to judge the world? You know, a lot of people don't like that word judge. Isn't that true? It's, it's almost a swear word in this culture today, judging. If you use that word, it's all understood as a negative term. How many, how many and, and yet I read Psalm 98, how many are kind of in agreement with Psalm 90? Bring it on, Lord. Judge the world, you know? You know judge sin. Deal with this bad stuff. Deal, deal with this injustice. You know, in a sense, you know, we say it's negative, but yet, meanwhile, we're fighting with each other because we want justice. We're fighting with each other because we want, you know, something to straighten this bad stuff out. Isn't that true? Isn't there a longing for things that are disordered and broken and bad to be fixed? How many want to see this world fixed? Of course we do. And I like what Bernhard Anderson says. Here the verb judge means much more than our English word suggests. It refers to the power to obtain and maintain justice and proper order. Power which human rulers should have. In other words, give us a a king to judge us. That's what it says in 1 Samuel 8, 6. But which in the biblical view is vested supremely and ultimately in God. In other words, all the disorder and injustice that we witness continually will finally come to an end. Amen. Amen. Anybody like that? All injustice is done with. Boom. And then God makes everything go into its proper order and proper alignment. Yeah, I like that. I'm with you, you know. Unfortunately, in this present time, there's a kingdom in conflict with the kingdom of this age, of God, right? But it's going to be destroyed. That's the amazing revelation that John had on the Isle of Patmos. It's the amazing conclusion of redemption power. God will destroy all the works of the kingdom of darkness, and he will rule forever and ever. It's interesting that in that vision, John saw the saints singing a new song. Remember, this is apocalyptic language, powerful images designed to capture our imagination. Here Jesus is described as the redemptive animal, the lamb. He's the sacrifice, right? Listen to what it says here. We're coming to an end. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elder. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. Now, all the literalists, I, I just want to, I hate to shock you. You know, Jesus doesn't have seven horns and seven eyes. These are expressions. Horn speaks of authority and eyes speak of being able to know everything. Seven is the perfect number. It's the perfect authority and the perfect vision. He's able to see what needs to be done. You know, I hate to say this, and it's true for every human being. We see imperfectly. How many say that's true? No matter how gifted of a leader, no matter how godly a leader, you, can't, you don't have all authority, and you don't, can't see everything perfectly. But I'm going to tell you, there's one who has all authority. His name is Jesus. And Jesus sees everything perfectly. He knows every human heart. He knows every situation. He judges absolutely perfectly. You know, if he was in a court of law, he'd never make a mistake. He knows every detail. Nobody could pull anything over his eyes. Isn't that great? It's going to happen. And he went, it says, and... He took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne because they were crying because who could open up the scrolls, right? They had seven seals. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song. What were they singing? The song of redemption. They were singing that God has defeated 
you know, the power of darkness. They were now free from that captivity. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God every person from every tribe and language and people and nations. Here the inclusivity. God is not excluding one single. He's including the entire world. There's no longer a distinct covenant people excluding everybody else. Now every nation can come in and be included into God's kingdom. I love this. And then he says, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. I don't know if you guys know this, but you are ruling and reigning with God on the earth right now. And you and I have authority. As we're praying, things are being brought into play. It's amazing what's going on. We, just, we don't see ourselves in this context. You know, where are you? You're seated in heavenly places when Christ Jesus. You and I are priests of the Most High God. You and I are kings. You know, I love C.S. Lewis. He's teaching kids that they are actually kings. What does he do? He's got Peter's the king and Lucy's the king. You know, isn't that amazing? He's trying to teach you a, a powerful lesson. You know, you and I are devaluing and diminishing us because we've got this bad wiring in our head and we've got a liar telling us all the time what we are not. But I'll tell you what we are. We're kings and priests of the Most High God. And listen to what it says. Then we see the culmination of the age. I love chapter 11, you know, because this is kind of a uh, cycling kind of a situation. And look what he says. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And then it says, and the 24 elders who were seated on the throne before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying... We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was. And I put notice, no longer is he described as yet to come. Why? Because he's come. In chapter 11, he's come. You know, we need to understand that. Because you have taken your great power and you have begun to what? You have begun to reign. Listen, he is reigning, but he will reign entirely and completely at this moment. And then it says in verse 18, the nations were angry and your wrath has come. And the time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both small and uh, great and small, and for, the, and for destroying those who destroyed the earth. Okay, who's destroying the earth? You have bought into what the evolutions, what evolutionists want you to think, I mean, the uh, environmentalists, we're all the bad guys here. No, you know what's destroyed the earth? Sin has destroyed the earth. What else has destroyed the earth? Satan has destroyed the earth. And the Antichrist has destroyed the earth. That's what's destroying the earth. Death is decaying the earth. That's what's destroying the earth. What needs to reverse this thing? That Christ comes back as ruler over this planet. And when Jesus is fully in charge, he's going he's to reverse everything that the enemy has brought into this world. He's going to reverse death and give life. He's going to reverse decay, and he's going to bring uh, flourishing and restoration. Isn't that beautiful? Healing for the nations. Read the book. It's powerful. Wow. I like what Dr. Longman says. In its original setting, the salvation accomplished by God, the warrior, was a military one. God won a victory for Israel, and the psalmist calls on the faithful in Israel to praise him. In the New Testament, Jesus is our warrior, but he fights against the spiritual powers and authorities, not against flesh and blood. That's the biggest problem we have. We think people are our enemy. Can I tell you, there's not one person that's your enemy. There's no flesh and blood that's your enemy. There's only one enemy. It's a spiritual entity, and he's influencing the lives of flesh and blood. That's what we need to understand. Thus, Christians are not wrong to sing the song of praise to Jesus, their warrior, who has won their spiritual salvation. Can I just say that Jesus is coming? Can I just tell you again, Jesus is coming? And he's coming to judge this world, and it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. I say bring it on. I think we need it. I think we need, you know, if you, you, you want to see a real transformation in our world, when Jesus shows up, you're going to see a real transformation. You're going to witness real transformation. Oh, that you and I could know the joy of Psalm 98. Can you, can you sing that new song like, you, like Augustine has sung it? That the fruitless joy is removed because the ultimate joy has come. You know, I, I, it's so tragic that so many people are struggling with issues of sin in their life, and they're toying with the fruitless joys. And God wants to come and set us free from those things and give us a new joy that's so much greater. The joy of knowing God. The joy of having his presence so real in our lives that those things, you know, make, make light of, you know, of the greater joy. I'm serious about this. 
I think too many Christians are, are locked into, you know, babying some pet sin in their life. Come on, let's be honest. But it's a fruitless joy, and we're afraid to lose it. But I'm telling you, you can't have the greater joy without letting go of the other little trinket, if I could say it that way, right? You got to let it go. You got to say, Lord, I want to sing this new song. I want to have victory in my life, even as a believer. I love how Isaac Watt captured the psalm so beautifully in his song, Joy to the World. Listen to the message. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. Is your heart preparing room for the King of kings and Lord of lords? Are you ready to receive him? Are you living in anticipation of him? Are you ready to have him come? Even this day, if he were to show up, you say, Lord, come on, I'm ready, I'm waiting, I'm ready to party with you right now. That amazing thought, how exciting would that be? Anybody up for that party? I'm totally up for that party. Bring it on, right? Joy to the earth. The Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. Do you have a song in your heart? Are you able to sing this amazing new song that God has delivered you from sin and judgment? Isaac Watts goes on to talk about creation's redemption. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Can you hear the echoing of all of creation crying out for God? Can you hear the birds singing praises to God? Can you hear the created world longing for his coming? Not that we worship the created world, but that the created world with us are all longing for the same thing. Even so, Lord Jesus, come back. Come to this planet. Rule and reign supreme. Bring everything out of order into order. Anybody up for that? I'm totally up for that. Let's do it. And every sickness flee. Every disease be conquered. No more death and dying. How many say I'm up for no more death and dying? How many are up for no more sin within my soul? No more sin from around my soul. Anybody up for a perfect environment? We're talking about utopia here, folks. This is it. This is utopia. We're living in dystopia, which is the opposite. It's true. Let's stand. Let's stand this morning. Wow. It's a call to worship. It's a call to worship. Do we, do we have an amazing kingdom? Do we have an amazing king? Do we have an amazing hope? Can we experience an amazing joy that can give us strength for all the challenges that we face? Maybe you're here today, say, you know, Pastor, I'm so discouraged. You know, I've just been so locked into my problems. I feel so weak. I'm trying to tell you right now, there is a strength awaiting you. There is a joy that Peter says, inexpressible, inexpressible joy. Do you need victory today? How many here say, Pastor, I need the power of Almighty God to bring victory in my soul. That's you today. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand today. Let's lift our hands to God. Say, Lord, may powerful victory come. May you invade my soul today. You know what's going to happen? You know, God wants you to be a channel. The kingdom of God is not meat nor drink, but what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, in the Spirit. It's a spiritual kingdom. You and I need joy. You and I need peace. You and I need hope. We need this king to invade this planet. How does he do it right now? Before he comes in person, he's actually sent a kingdom ahead of him, a spiritual kingdom. You and I are forerunners. We've landed on the beach you know, we're the paratroopers behind the lines. We're ready for the invasion of the king to the planet. We're the heralds saying, make way, make ready for the Lord. We're calling people to make way because the king is coming. The king is coming. We're shouting to people in this planet, the king is coming, the king is coming. Prepare the way of the Lord. The king is coming. And are we just so full of that message and so full of hope and so full of joy? that there's a cry of victory in our soul, that God has defeated the things in our life that have held us down and held us back. And I wanna pray right now. I wanna pray that everything that's holding you back, every fear that's holding you down, 
every sin that's a fruitless joy. I'm going to pray right now that God is going to enter in and smash it. I'm going to pray that today that God is going to enter in and do a supernatural work, that you and I are going to be able to sing the song of joy. We're going to be able to shout for joy because of the marvelous thing that God did on October 11, 2020, in the midst of a COVID experience, in the middle of difficulty, challenge, and crisis, that God's joy broke into our soul because we experienced the power of the living God within. And so, Father, I believe for that today. I believe that you're moving supernaturally in our hearts right now as we open our lives. We're preparing our hearts right now. We're opening them up saying, Lord, come. We're inviting you to invade our soul today. We're inviting your spirit to invade our lives. Holy Spirit, would you fill us to overflowing? May we have another Pentecost in our soul this morning. May we experience the power of the living Christ just filling our hearts to overjoy that we could say like Peter, I have an inexpressible joy. I have an amazing hope. It's transcending my family. It's transcending my attitudes. It's transcending my life. Man, the power of God is just oozing out of me. I'm becoming this radical royal ambassador for God. I'm running up and down the highways and the byways. I'm calling people to prepare the way of the Lord. I'm calling people into the kingdom. I've now become a dynamic herald for the kingdom of God. I'm excited. I'm not allowing the distractions of this world. My ambitions are changing. I'm moving away from selfish ambition. I'm being set free from the things that are chaining me up and binding me, Lord, to a lesser life and a lesser joy. And I thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. I receive your power today. I receive your forgiveness today. I receive your hope today. I receive your joy today. I receive your blessings today. I receive your favor today. I walk out in the power of the Spirit. I recognize that I'm a king of the Most High God. I am a priest of the Most High God. I have authority because you have all authority. And I'm walking in that power today in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, receive it. In the name of Jesus, open your heart to it and say, Lord, I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. I'm receiving your presence right now. I'm receiving your power right now. I'm receiving your forgiveness right now. I'm receiving your joy right now. I'm receiving hope right now. I'm receiving healing right now. I believe God is healing sick bodies right now. I believe God is touching some of you right now. The spirit of the living God is touching you right now. Receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you leave. Thanks again for joining us this morning. We've loved having you. Once again, we do want to get in touch with you. We want to hear from you. So go ahead, follow that link to our church website and click the Get Connected button and we'll get in contact with you. And you can give from that same place. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Be blessed.